of the day for City Point to be encouraged. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's a pleasure, actually, and a privilege uh, to be with you. Love your pastors, uh, Dan and uh, Joel. Uh, ever since they arrived in New Zealand, we uh, you know, we became friends right then at the beginning and uh, have uh, been encouraging one another ever since. And it's such a privilege. I love your church. I love uh, a lot of people in your church. And it's a real joy to uh, be here today just to uh, share uh, with you. Uh, some of you just come back from this uh, what, ANC uh, conference. And uh, Pastor Ben's gone down Campbell, hasn't he, to, uh, to share down there. I'm going down there in, in, uh, in a little while, so looking forward uh, to that. You fired up uh, with the conference? Awesome? Yeah, good. Because I just felt, uh, Zara, uh, I've got to preach in a minute, but um, I really want to encourage you. I really do, because I like you. I, I think that you're, isn't she enormously, wonderfully faithful servant? What a gift to have uh, in the church. Amen. But I think at that conference, I just felt, I was thinking about you last night, and I felt, you know, th that conference was for you uh, an oasis and a time of replenishment and refreshing, because you actually went in there somewhat jaded, somewhat tired, and that's because you've been giving yourself, you know, spending yourself willingly and sacrificially for the purposes and the service of God. And God sees that. And you were drawn to the conference. That invitation was extended as, to, uh, as a stirring of the Holy Spirit in, inside your own pastor's heart to uh, bring you into that place in order that you might drink. And God is sowing something in, your, in that conference. He's sowing a seed. It's not as if the seed actually uh, is, is um, uh, like recently planted, but I'm, what, what I mean by that is that he's breathed on a seed that was sown. That's what I feel that God is sowing. And has awakened a vision that was on the inside of you that had been laid down and put to one side because of the time. Uh, you, you know, time is passing. And uh, you began to wonder whether or not there was ever going to be that breakthrough. And you begin to enter into what the promise of God is in terms of the ultimate destiny for your life. Well, that conference was a catalyst because God breathed upon that seed and he's awakened the dream on the inside. And so I just felt the Lord to give you this encouragement, to give you affirmation and confirmation that the stirring that you're finding on the inside uh, is him. And so you to be confident now and trust because God is going to open up a wide door of ministry opportunity, which is far more expansive than you imagine. You're wonderfully gifted and you're making an almost incredible uh, contribution to the church. But that is going to increase and it's going to be uh, uh, more uh, fulfilling and wonderful and imagining and fruitful than you've even uh, considered that it might be. It's just a little longer now, but this, so, so wait patiently for the Lord to act. But I believe before the end of this year, that doorway is going to open up for you and you're going to enter in. So be confident, be encouraged, and continue to do this. God wants you to be intentional in terms of because of your, your willing servant heart to, to make uh, it a priority that you feed yourself and find rest, all right? Because he's built up an incredible capacity uh, within you to uh, take on the responsibility that's coming. But he also wants you to get into the discipline, okay, of uh, spending time feeding, drinking, and yourself being refreshed and replenished in order you might sustain what is to come. So I'll just leave that with you. You know the whole thing, the desires of your heart thing? Yeah, God's given you that. All right, you resurrected something, you desired, you laid it down, he's breathed upon it again, and it will soon come to pass before the end of 2020. Glory to God. All right? Okay. Good. I want to talk to you this morning about his reassuring presence. And uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, Matthew 11 is uh, what I want to uh, uh, preach from, this particular text. So let's open our hearts to hear from the Word of God. Let's see where God leads us this morning. You're yeah, coming with a sense of expectancy. All right. Uh, Pastor Ben has said to me just to go mad. Well, no, he didn't. He said to go loose. No, he said just to be free. And Pastor Shane and Joel, they with her to that when I came in this morning. So I just will, you know, just go with the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. Father, bless this word to the hearts of your people. 
Lord, let them experience you. They seek you. Come by your spirit, touch their hearts. Encourage them with your truth and with your love and with the reassuring reality of your experience. Story of uh, John uh, the Baptist in prison. I'll read from uh, this one in uh, Matthew 11. When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to his 12 disciples, he went out to teach and preach in towns throughout the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing, so he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him God blesses those who do not turn away uh, because uh, of me. Um, I've been a Christian for you know, a long time now, uh, well, over, well over 40 years, and I remember my first encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, the reality of his experience. I was at a full gospel businessman's dinner. I had been invited to go to that dinner by a friend whom I worked with. It was held in the Pakaranga Arts Center a very, very long time ago. In fact, I think it was the very first full gospel businessman's dinner uh, in Pakaranga. The name of the speaker was Bill Zabriskie. Anybody heard of Bill Zabriskie? Bill Zabriskie was a lawyer, and uh, he became one of uh, New Zealand's uh, well-known evangelists, now with uh, the Lord. But uh, he was speaking. I was very interested. He was a lawyer at that time, and I was, I was in the, the legal world. So I was interested to hear what he had to say. And I went and uh, uh, heard Bill share his own story about he, how he found the reality, God's reality, through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, you know, there's obviously always going to be an invitation at these kind of meetings to receive Jesus. I didn't know that. I thought I was just going for a dinner and hearing, hearing a, a, you know, a story. But uh, the moment came at the end of the meeting when Bill said, if you feel the need to know God, uh, if you want to know God, of course, and of course he presented the gospel about the way being through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gave uh, anyone who felt that drawing to just stand. We're all seated. He said, and everyone had their eyes closed, heads bowed, the usual thing. And uh, he said, I just want you to stand if you would like to give your heart to Jesus. Now, I'd been seeking. I didn't know I had been seeking, but I had been seeking, you know, asking all the big questions of life. You know, what is it all about? Where did we come from? Uh, looked up at the universe, you know, the sky, the mystery of that, the complexity of that, and thinking, oh, there's got to be more than this. You know, considering the great mysteries of life, the universe and woman, I couldn't work them all out. And so here I am in this meeting, and I hear this message, and I'm sitting at the table, and I'm holding on to the table, and my heart is really pounding. Like, you know, I've got palpitations. <laughs> I could feel my heart beating. And there's this war going on inside which said, Wayne, this is what you need to do. And the other half of me was saying, don't be an idiot. Don't do this. But this drawing was so powerful. And it just felt like, you know, love. And so I stood up. And when I stood up, I had a little peek out of my eye to make sure I wasn't the only one standing up. And I looked around. It was quite comforting to see, you know, several other men uh, standing also. And then Bill led us in this prayer, asking Jesus Christ to come to our hearts, to be our Lord and Savior, repenting of sin. You know, you know the deal. When I prayed that prayer, I just felt this wonderful, wonderful peace. Something just like come upon me like a warm blanket. You know, it's kind of like, how can I describe my God encounter? Like this. It was just... And my heart, which has been beating really fast, just slowed down. And I was just filled with the most incredible peace I have ever experienced in my life. I knew I'd met God. And I opened my eyes, and the whole room was just filled with light. I couldn't see. Everything, everybody looked, you know, looked, my friend was in front of me, the friend who had bought me, and he was shaking my hand. And I just, you know, noticed the 
smile on his dial because he was excited. I could just make him out, but the, the, the room was full of light and I was full of this peace. And I got home, probably about 11 o'clock at night, and I woke my wife up as I was you know, getting ready for bed. And I had to say to her, Wendy, God is real. God is real. And that peace lasted for something like about six weeks, and, and I just, just floated, you know, floated through life. It was wonderful. It's like kind of being in the flow. Have you ever been in the flow of God's presence? I mean, have you? It's a beautiful place to be. And so I, just, I was just in that, in that zone. And then after about six weeks, I was at home one day, and I just felt, you know, the thing that came on me just kind of, kind of lifted. And I thought, whoa, what's happened here? I mean, I noticed the contrast experientially, subjectively. And I didn't know much about prayer, but I knelt down by my bed, <laughs> put my hands together, and I prayed, and I said, God, what's happened? I think I was actually weeping a little bit. God, what's happened? And then the telephone rang. Do you know what a telephone is? One of those things, they, it's a cr wonderful, wonderful scientific invention. Little box thing, receiver on it in the house, had wires. And, you know, and your voice would travel through the wire. I mean, it was incredible. Anyhow, the phone rang right at the moment I'd finished it. Right at the moment I had finished my prayer. God, what am I supposed to do? Where are you? What am I supposed to do? The phone ring. I pick up the phone. It's the associate pastor from the Baptist Church here in Howard. And he says, Wayne, I heard that you've become a Christian. And he invited me along to a small group that they were running. And that began the process of discipleship. You see, isn't God good? You see, God knew that I had to grow up. You know, he had me cotton wool as that little baby, but the, I had to grow up. And so those are the... You know, the miraculous touches of God in the first few weeks of uh, not just coming to know him, but beginning to journey with him. But, you know, the thing that I reflect on and remember is not only the gospel that was shared in my own heart response to that, but the reassuring reality of the presence of God with me. I could have been martyred at that point. Nothing would have caused me to deny the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the point I'm sharing this is because I want to encourage you in regard to that particular pursuit of laying hold of the presence of God in your own life in a real and experiential way. We know that God is with us. We know from his word, the promise of his word, that he is always with us. But I want to tell you something, and I'm sure you're just the same as me. It is natural for the human heart to need reassurance of that presence and that reality. Would that be right? I mean, most of you are here today. I wonder why you came to church. I hope you're not just going through the motions. I hope it's not just something that you do. I hope it's, you're here because you wanted to be in an environment Whereas it is easy to begin to focus in and lay hold of the real presence of God, in addition to hearing the revelation of his truth. So that work of uh, deepening intimacy and transformation in your world, in your heart, can continue to take place. I hope that's why you're here. I hope that you're here because you wanted a sense of connection with God. You wanted a touch of his presence. And my prayer is that that would be your experience to some degree today because we constantly need this reminder. It's very, very human. <clears throat> Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. He says, We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief or any other will automatically remain in the mind. It must be fed. It must be fed. Amen. Now, I know in the feeding, God's word is foundational to that. But it's not just God's word that we need reminding of. We also need the personal, tangible, experiential evidences that affirm his truth to fuel us with a deeper faith and hope. 
and the importance of experiential encounters with the presence of God for the, is for the affirmation of our faith. And that, I tell you, as God gave me a sort of a revelation of the significance of this, is all the way through Scripture and particularly in the New Testament. Particularly. Verses are just leaping out to me that are focused on not just revelation of the Word, but revelation of His reality, revelation of His experience. And the two of those actually are meant to go together always. Now listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 1 verse 19. This is Peter remembering, reflecting on the wonderful experiential encounter that he, James, and John had on Jesus on the mountain at the transfiguration. You know the story. Where the glory of God just appears on Jesus. Moses and Elijah are made manifest as well. The voice comes from heaven again. This is my own beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That would be quite an awesome moment, don't you think? As a follower of Jesus, to participate you know, in the experiential realm of the, of the full glory of God. I mean, it must have been momentous. Well, you know, Peter reflecting on that experience, as he writes 1 Peter, says this. He says, because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. Now, do you see the importance of the experience in relationship to the word, the word that the, the experience gives affirmation and confidence and confirmation in the truth of the word. So they must always go together, particularly in terms of our witness. And I believe that such God moments are important for the ongoing strengthening of our spiritual resilience, especially when the complexity and challenges of life seek to overwhelm us and crowd God out of our focus. And isn't that happening all the time? There are so many distractions in this world and all designed to remove that sense of connect. So all of us, from time to time, need the reassuring reality of His presence. And so you come to this story in Matthew 11, and it should be of encouragement to us because the man of whom Jesus said, John the Baptist, was the greatest of all who have ever lived, faced an occasion when he too needed the evidence of Christ's real experience. And so, you know, this, this is like helpful to you and I. Because, you know, Jesus considered John to be the greatest of all men who had ever lived. I mean, that's an incredible compliment from the Lord himself, isn't it? God, uh, John obviously had some standing, you know, in, in the eyes and in the heart of Jesus. But here in this experience, we find John needing reassurance of the presence of Jesus. Confirmation, affirmation that he is present. He is here. And so we, there are some lessons here. I mean, if you're here and you're feeling in that way today, I mean, we don't, you know, we wouldn't ordinarily talk about it in, in conversation with one another in terms of, you know, where we really are at spiritually. But if you're here today and you would just like the reassurance of the reality of his presence, then John gives us an indication in terms of the pathway that we ought to walk in order to, you know, Enter into that reality. I mean, wouldn't you love that? To leave church today knowing that God has touched you in some way? I mean, great for the you know, little prophetic word. I mean, that's part of it, isn't it? And I hope it meant something to you. But it's part of it. You know, we need... This is the place where there's incredible potential for the manifest presence of God to be experienced, to be made known. And we should come to church every Sunday with that kind of expectation. Well, 
Take away this. If you need the reassuring reality of his presence, just ask for it. Matthew 11, verse 2, 3, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things Jesus was doing, so he sent his disciples to what? To ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we have been expecting, or should we be looking for somebody else? So John is quite clearly in a state where he's needing reassurance that Jesus is present. Maybe it was because of the emotional depletion of the dark and dismal circumstances of his imprisonment. Or perhaps he felt his work had been wasted and he was just in a, in a, in a moment of utter despair. Whatever the case, all of us can empathize with John's struggle. You know what it's like. All of us go through this experience when we feel like we're caged in. We feel like we're stuck. We feel like we're in a, 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 pr a prison. You know, when, when, when our circumstances are suffocating us and, and hope is fading fast. And I don't know about you, but in those moments, I just long for the comforting, reassuring presence that God is with me. God, are you with me? What's happening? Where are you? Because sometimes it feels like he's not there. Even though his truth says he is, but it feels like he's not there. And so we become and can be a little shaken as a consequence of, of that. And the psalmist in Psalm 42, you know, uh, illustrates this in the expression of his own longing for being in the presence of God, he cries out, as the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, God. Oh, God, I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? You ever felt like that? God, I just long for you. I just long to be standing with you. I, I just long to have you. In my, in my presence. And I just wonder whether that even echoes your heart today. You're all here with different things going on in your life. We've all got something going on. Some may be greater challenges and onslaughts and trials right at this very moment than others may be having. But, you know, the cry is in your heart. Jesus, where are you in this? Are you, are you with me? Are you near? But you know, God understands that. And whenever we're in that place of, of deep longing, you know, when, that, when there is that ache in our hearts, God, I just need to know more of you. I want more of you. I want an experience of your, your love and, and, and your presence and, and that peace that comes with you. You know, Jesus... Our loving and compassionate Christ extends to us, all of us, in that invitation. John 7, verses 37 and 38. This is, this is Jesus. Maybe, this, maybe these words this morning might speak to you. Maybe they will, the appeal will strike something in your heart because that longing and that ache is there. And you can imagine Jesus Preaching this, speaking this, crying, calling, calling this out to the crowd. Anyone who's thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. So if you're thirsty, Jesus says, I'll come. Will you, will you come? Anyone. Anyone who believes. Anyone who will trust enough to come. Anyone who believes in me will drink. And he says, then rivers of living water will flow from the heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit. 
I think that's beautiful because the amazing thing is that whenever your heart seeks after him in that way, ironically, it is the evidence already that God is on your case. Because Jesus said, no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. And so if there is a drawing, if there is a longing, if there is a desire, if there is a hunger, if there's a cry in your heart, that in itself is God pulling you to himself by his spirit that he might answer your cry and bless you with his presence. Because in your asking, you are responding to the drawing <laughs> that will lead you to the touch of Christ, the presence of God with you, the very thing that you need in the midst of your circumstances. And I want to say this, it's not uh, a lack of faith to ask. It isn't a lack of faith. Your asking in itself is evidence of faith. And what you are asking, though, is for your faith to be refueled and reinforced because that is what you need right now. So it's all about pursuing the encounter. It's all about pursuing the experiential touch that leads to the felt confidence that God is with you. And Jeremiah 19 verse 13 has a be very beautiful, encouraging word if you're in that place. The word says, you will seek me and find me <laughs> when you seek me with all of your heart. And so if that's all of your heart, God, I need the reassuring touch of your presence. I just need to know that you're with me. I just need that affirmation. I just need that confirmation. I need my faith revitalized, refueled, reignited. I need the touch of God. If that's you this morning, if that's you today, then I want you to respond to that invitation. I want you to ask in your heart and in your asking Come, come to him and receive the drink that he has for you, the life-giving water. But when you come, come in surrender. It really means a letting go and, and a laying hold of. And you come with a sense of expectation that Jesus will in some way fill you with that reassuring, life-giving reality that he is with you. Amen? Because we all need it. Terrible times. You need it. It's pretty tough for you right now. And it's felt really dry on the inside, hasn't it? And it's like, am I ever going to get through this? Am I ever going to be able to get over this mountain? Am I ever going to be able to rise above it? And how can I do it? The Lord says, look. Your help will come from me. I will give you the strength. And even today, look, this word for you is the Spirit of God giving you affirmation and encouragement and comfort and consolation to remind you that he is, in fact, on your case. Because you thought that you were walking the journey alone. You thought that God didn't even care. Do you even know? <laughs> Where are you, God, in this? And the enemy has tried to undermine your faith and cause your faith to wander. Amen? And mum has been trying to encourage you and trying to speak life into you and trying to impart hope to you. And you're saying, well, where are you, God? Why don't you speak to me? And he already is. It's just the cloud won't allow you to see 
and hear and understand. And I just feel this appeal of the Spirit of God. I don't know, you know, God is actually, this is endearing, isn't it? But I feel the Father heart of God drawing you near and saying, little one, he calls you little one. I think that's really endearing, don't you? Little one, come to me. Come close. Because you need the reassuring love of the Father's heart. Because it's not been there. Amen? And so the enemy has eroded your sense of self-confidence and your self-esteem and your self-worth and your value. And you're wondering, what on earth am I about? And what on earth is my life about? And God wants you to know that he's got this and he's on your case. And the breakthrough, even now as I speak to you, is happening. The fellow ground that the enemy has established in your heart to try and keep you at a distance of God, even now is being broken by the hand of his spirit and the touch of his love for you. And he's bringing healing right now into your world. He's bringing healing. He's bringing healing right now. And he's filling you afresh with a sense of peace and with a sense of hope and expectation. For there is a life to live, a fruitful life, life filled with love and peace. And that which the enemy meant for harm in you, God, by his grace and love toward you, has, is turning that for good. Amen. Amen. So peace, little one, for the Lord your God is with you. And when you stand and you look at what is in front of you, you'll be just like Joshua, feeling that sense of fear. (laughs) All right? Wonder. But I just got that, that Joshua word. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. And you will overcome, because you're an overcomer, born of your spirit. And victory begins today, now. You're going forward. You're going upward. You're going higher. You're rising up, woman of God. Be encouraged. He's with you. Does it mean something? Good. Good. Praise the Lord. It's wonderful. But you see, for you and you, (laughs) isn't this what it's about? God just... That's the essence of the prophetic word, by the way. God is with you. He will also, listen, this is a bit of a cliche. All right. Give me a hand. I want you to feel that. Connection. You'll recover all that the enemy, the locusts have eaten. You'll recover all that the enemy has stolen. That's his promise. Amen? You'll recover all. It won't be in the same ways, but it's going to be in a far more beautiful and wonderful way. And so you watch what God will do. Because you're going to see the goodness of God. You're going to taste of the goodness of God. Even over the next few days, there's going to be two or three little things that come your way. Just little things. But there will be signs of the love of God And the heart of God to remind you that he's interested in every little detail of your life. Amen. Amen. You've got a beautiful heart. Beautiful heart. And despite the storm, you have stood standing. And the reward of God is coming. Is on its way. In this world and accruing in the next because of your faithfulness and because of your heart. Amen. Just bless you. Just bless you. We'll be finishing about five today, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Um, all right. So if you need his reassurance, you okay? You all right with me? Oh, good. No. Oh, Shane is listening. That's good. Pastor Shane, thank you. I'll speak to Pastor Shane. Shane, if you need the reassuring presence of God, you ask. When you need the reassurance 
of God, you listen and you look. Verses 4 and 5. Jesus told them, go back and tell John what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. Yeah, I uh, used to work for the Justice Department. I used to have that job. Uh, anyone been to court here? If, if you've been to court, you'll know what I mean. I was the guy that sit in front of the judge. If you came to give witness, I would uh, ask you to place your hand on the Bible. If you didn't believe in God, then you were to solemnly and sincerely swear and affirm that the evidence that you're about to give in the matter now before the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The evidence of the truth. In order to prove something, there must be evidence to support that truth. And so I want to, I want to encourage you with this, that you know, we can sometimes have a wrong understanding of faith. But let me just tell you something about faith. God never asks us to exercise blind faith. We think blind faith is a spiritual place. It's a foolish place more often than not. Because the Bible tells us that faith, the Christian faith, is evidence-based. Always evidence-based. Let's go to Abraham for a minute. What about Abraham? Isn't he the hero of faith? Isn't he the one who stepped out not knowing where he was going? Is that blind faith? Well, maybe on the surface. But it wasn't. Because Abraham never stepped out on the basis of blind faith. He stepped out on the basis of a real experiential counter where he received not only the word of God, but the revelation of God. I think God appeared to Abraham along his journey at least around about nine times just to keep him going forward. So the basis of that faith step was always evidenced by, yes, the word and the experiential reality of God involved in the process. Do you see that? Now listen to Hebrews 11 verse 1, King James Version, because it suited what I wanted to share today. today. The word says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, listen to this, the evidence of things not seen. So truth always needs evidence. It's the meaning of the Greek word there, evidence. And even unseen things will be evidenced or proven as God enables you to see them. And that's just a matter of pure logic because, you know, to exercise faith blindly might be illustrated by this picture. I want you to go out to Cascade Road, put a blindfold on. No, let's make it the Pakaranga Highway. Put a blindfold on and try crossing it. Blind faith. But you see, God has given us minds capable of reasoning. Well, some of us have minds capable of reasoning. Critiquing, evaluating, and deciding. And he doesn't expect that we should put our trust in him without evidence. And that is why the gospel is to be presented with both word and experiential encounter with his power and with his presence. All the time. Nicodemus, you know about Nicodemus, the Pharisee who knew that there was something in Jesus that it really attracted him and really appealed to him. And so he, he goes to Jesus at night. And listen, listen to what he says. This is John 3 verse 12. We all know that God has sent you to teach us. Then he says, your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Acts 14, verse 3. I think this is Paul and Barnabas and Iconium. Listen to this. The Lord proved their message. The message has to be proved. True. How did he prove the message? The Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. I want you to think about that in terms of your own witness. 
People need to know God is with you. They need the evidence. The evidence, of course, is in your transformed life, in your love and your acts of kindness and your acts of service and your church is wonderful at that. But it is also required in terms of the manifest supernatural power of the Holy Spirit moving in you and through you so that people know that God is with you. Not just through the transformative life, but through the ministry of supernatural power that brings to them healing, freedom, release, recovery. Do you agree with that? We're meant to be a Holy Spirit people, We're meant to be a power filled people. Why? Because in the propagation of the message, people not only need proclamation of the word, they need to hear the truth of God, but they need the demonstration of the reality of the word of God to give affirmation of that truth. And that's exactly what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew, sorry, Mark 16, when he gives them the great commission. Now, so God's truth is to be heard and seen. And John desperately wanted proof that Jesus the Messiah was present. So Jesus tells John's disciples to go back and give John the evidence. Tell him what you have seen and heard. And so that's encouraging to us as well. Because when you're uncertain about what God is doing, or if you wonder if he's doing anything, he invites you to search out his presence. And it's actually a very simple process. It's given to us in Psalm 46, verse 10. It says this, Be still and know that I am God. Still there means, look, yeah, really, relax. It means stop. It means be quiet. Were we told as young Christians to have a quiet time? We've lost the art. Life is so darn busy. It's so darn noisy. It's so darn chaotic. But God says, if you need to know my presence, it's important for you to stop. It's important for you to be still so that you know that he's God. Because in the stillness, as you focus in, you become aware of his presence. And I want to tell you, that is a feeling. It's a feeling, whether that's peace or whether it's, and it's, it's usually always peace, but, but it's just, it might even just be a confidence that, that God is, is with you. In fact, you know, my heart is this, that I will live every day in the conscious awareness of God's presence with me. Now, it's really hard to do that in this life, in, in this world. It's really Difficult in a chaotic, noisy world which works constantly to disconnect you from the awareness in order to steal that piece uh, of his presence. But we've got to be intentional around it. And some of us have been drawn away or taken away from that intentionality. And we're not experiencing God like we ought to. We're not aware of his conscious presence like we should be because we're failing to do that. So we have to do it. It's not just going to happen. You've got to come to him, remember, in order to receive the living water. I guess we might call that process prayer in a way. There's a great minister, Apostle Maldonado, South American guy, travels all around the world. He says this. He says, the purpose of prayer is to affirm the existence of God, to be filled with faith, not only in terms of answered prayer, but in terms of experiential awareness of his presence. But I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, well, for, in order for that to happen, happen, think about how you pray. In order for that to happen, prayer is less about you speaking to God and more about you listening to God and looking for God to become more aware of God. <laughs> Some of you need to become more aware of God so that you can be encouraged by the reality of his presence, just as little one was this morning. You need it desperately. And Jesus says, come, come. You're needing a refocus. 
Because I could, I, I, you know, I see the mind being bombarded by many distractions which will cause you to easily succumb to the power of anxiety and, and worry. And it becomes a whirlwind for you sometimes, especially when you're lying there at night trying to get to sleep, all these things racing around your mind. God wants you to take your eyes off the storm and focus on him. He wants you to step out of that boat. And you need reassurance that this is the invitation of God. And I'm getting that picture of Peter stepping out of the boat and walking on water. Jesus said, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. I, I just felt God is using me today because he loves you so much and has so many, many wonderful things that he wants to bring into your life experience and grow you into a deeper, more intimate relationship with you so that you might walk in a greater sense of security and safety and confidence. He's longing for you just to come. And receive from him. I really feel his heartbeat for you. You are so incredibly precious to him. And there are so many things that he has stored in that open heaven that he wants you to draw down on in your coming and in your seeking and in your request. He wants you to know the goodness of God because it feels like for you, the walk has been somewhat arid, routine, same old, same old. But God says, I want you to live, not just exist. Your financial provision is in his care. Amen. But there's a ministry on the inside too that he wants to begin to breathe on and draw out. Because out of all of the trial, he's established the empathetic, caring, concerned heart. And that's why you worry. You worry about them, them too, those who are near and dear to you. <laughs> all right? Don't worry. Draw near. And God will give you the supernatural resource for you to be sustain your walk in the place of confidence and peace. Keep your eyes on him. The storm will settle. This is a word of intervention so that you won't sink. Because it's felt like things are overwhelming you. God's got your hand. Give me your hand. Pulling what? Up. Up. You didn't actually have to do that, but I love, it. I, I love your obedience. But, but in a sense, yeah, rise up, woman of God. Watch how you will minister when that confidence is restored. Amen. All right. You want the next bit? I'll finish soon. So it'll be about 4.30, about 5, right? Okay, so, but don't you love the presence? And God loves us coming into his presence, loves to be part of his presence. Okay, so you're needing reassurance of the presence. You ask, ask for it. You listen for it. You look for it. God meets you through your senses. And in that journey, if you're needing it, don't give up in the pursuit of it. Don't give up. I'll finish with this. Verse 6, and he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. The Passion Translation says, the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. You see, that's for you, that word. Uh, the blessing of heaven comes for those who don't give up on him, but, but wait for him. The blessing of heaven comes. And my God, it's coming your way because of your beautiful heart and spirit it will come no matter what happens now I want to tell you just finishing and something really peculiar about John's struggle because you know John's in prison 
He's in a pretty bad place, pretty bad shape. We understand that. But he said, God, Jesus, are you really present? Are you really here? He was the one who, he was the pathway in the wilderness. He spoke about the coming of the, the Messiah. Are you really here, Jesus? It's extraordinary to think that John could be in that place because he had already had that truth and had that revelation. Listen to John 1, verse 32. This is John. I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting on him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one you see the Spirit descend on rest and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus. This is John. So I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Does that kind of like encourage you? It tells me something about the human heart and the human experience. Such is the nature of the human heart that despite past experiences of his divine presence, we can still be tempted to lose sight of what he has already shown us. And that's called the fight of faith that you and I are in. The devil fiercely wars against you to undermine your ability to hold on. He aims to get you to a place of despair where you can go either way. You either go to God or you run from God. That's the decision in that place. And in the midst of that place is the invitation of Jesus, come to me. And Jesus says here, hold on. No matter what happens, and you'll be blessed. C.S. Lewis also says this, faith is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted despite your moods. The ultimate reward that comes with holding on, Jesus says, is that God blesses. Now, is that blessing the breakthrough that you're longing for? Maybe. Is it the healing? Maybe. Is it the provision? Maybe. But I think, you know, in the end, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's greater than that. And it's irrespective of your circumstances. What it is, that blessing, ultimately, for you and I, is the reassuring, tangible, experiential sense of God's presence with you. Because if you know God's with you, you can overcome anything. And when you're born of the Spirit, you're meant to be an overcomer, born of God. Not living in the place of defeat. Not living in the place of despair, but in the place of victory. Now, John went from victory to defeat, and we think, how could he do that? Well, we do it all the time. <laughs> but the neat thing is there is always the way back. And Jesus knows and understands that and offers to us that white beautiful invitation to come and drink of his life-giving water. Romans 14, verse 17, last scripture, the kingdom of God is righteousness. So the kingdom of God is the transformative work of the Holy Spirit in you, creating you to become more like Christ, building your character. And if the Spirit of God is in you, you'll never stay the same. You've got to be different. You will be different. The kingdom of God is righteousness, but the kingdom of God is also peace and joy. Peace and joy are emotive, subjective, experiential responses to the presence of God with you. And so with that presence comes that manifestation of his peace and his joy. And I'm not saying that faith rests on feelings or emotions, but what I am saying is this, that any divine experience, whether that is gentle or dramatic, is never devoid of them. The touch of God is experiential in some way. And all of us, from time to time, need that kind of experience, that kind of encounter, for the reinforcement of the resilience of our faith.
Would that be true? It's true for me. And so I'm not ashamed to pursue God for it and to admit <laughs> my need of him. I just long for him. I just ache for him. I just want more of what God has got for us. I really do. And I know that you do too. Amen. <sighs> Betrayal is a hard thing to work through and to, to get over, isn't it? It stops you trusting him again. It really undermines your confidence and your ability just to open up your heart and, and, and commit. And God, I think this is just encouragement of God's love and heart towards you and really wants to reassure you and really wants you to know that in that journey, when you really thought that you were alone in it and seeking to work through actually uh, with your own strength and your own intellect you, 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 there's something you, there's great intelligence there and and a great resilience I think you really are quite a competent and capable person so you, you got yourself through almost as if it was on you know your own terms and your own strength and you, you become a fighter uh, which is, you know, which is, you know, good in some sense. But God wants you to know that he, he was actually in there re res resourcing you and, uh, and enabling you to, to you know, to, to push through. And it wasn't an easy journey. But you've come out the other side. And you are victorious. But the ability to actually trust again has been undermined and needs to be restored. Because there's a whole lot of love in there that God wants to see the lid taken off in terms of your, the exposure of your heart so that it can spill out. <sighs> Doing something in your spirit right now. Okay? Spirit is reaching deep. This is because he cares for you so much. His compassionate heart is toward you. And he's sinking deep into those areas now all right, where there lies that betrayal. The mars and scars of the activity of the, the enemy that sought to tear you down. Lots of hard words too spoken into your heart and spirit. And by spirit now he's ministering to those places. And he's radiating them now with a sense of his peace and his presence and his love. And he's bringing healing deep within the spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to her in such a way that hope would rise again and confidence would rise again. Safety and security would rise again with the assuring reality of your presence with her and that Lord you would heal the memories so that Father she is not bound by what lays behind but is instead renewed and excited with fresh anticipation for the blessing that is to come for it is a day of release and the cage is opened and you merely have to walk out of that cage out of that door and begin the process of journeying along a pathway towards increasing freedom and towards greater fruitfulness. Okay, so there's a kind of unlocking today. There's a worship gift in there too, by the way. I th there's a worship gift in there, but it's been contained, restrained. And you try worshiping God at home in song. 
it will affect the continual breakthrough that God is doing in and through your life. I don't, honestly, I, I don't know. Have you ever thought about that? Because I just feel that that is something that is actually in there. And I've got a picture, a picture of you doing that, worshiping God, lifting your voice, and praise and adoration, and exaltation, carrying the countenance of God on you, the kind of glory coming on you, the shift in your countenance so that your real beauty can shine through and be a blessing and lead others even into their presence. I've got no idea whether you can sing a note, but I'm just telling you, I'm just running with the impressions that God has placed upon my heart. I hope it means something to you. Praise the Lord. You know, 